Welcome to the show. I am James Swanick. There are so many non-alcoholic beers and wines on the market today. The culture has changed. Younger people are turning their back on alcohol like nothing before. And dozens, hundreds in fact, of non-alcoholic alternatives are now on the market. They're being sold in bars and restaurants and supermarkets. And today we're going to be talking to one of those award-winning non-alcoholic beers and wine brands by the name of Groovy, G-R-U-V-I. And they are based out of Denver, Colorado. And we're about to have a conversation with one of the CEOs of that company, uh, Annika Sawney, whose uh, family comes from Toronto, Canada, but they moved to Denver, Colorado to set up this brand. And you may have heard me speak on the show about the scientific study that we did in the first part of 2023 when the University of Washington took a whole bunch of participants and put them through our 90-day stop drinking process. And the result of that was a 98% reduction in drinking. You can see those results at alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash study. Well, Annika and her company Groovy helped us tremendously with that by giving us, I think, probably maybe like 20% of the participants, maybe 15 to 20% of the participants who went through that scientific study um, were actually Groovy customers because Groovy actually promoted our scientific study uh, before it began calling for participants. So, uh, And then since then, candidly, full disclosure, I am an investor in Groovy. Um, So I wanted to put that out there. And we're going to have a conversation now about the alcohol-free drink space, patterns that have emerged, how Groovy got started, and where we think the non-alcoholic space is going. So with that, enough from me. Annika, great to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. No, I'm super excited to be here and chat with you today. And as you said, we've been familiar with each other for a while, so it's nice to kind of put this conversation and dive a little bit deeper. Now, you are in your late 20s, and you run this company, Groovy, with your brother. Just tell us a little bit about where you guys are from and how this brand came to be. Yeah, so we launched Groovy in 2019, so we actually just came up on our fifth year birthday, which was a very exciting milestone. Um, And so, yeah, my brother, Nikki, who's actually five years older than I, We started this company and it really came from a bit of our own personal journeys with alcohol. And so five years ago, you know, I was actually in my last year of university at McGill and I was actually studying neuroscience, thought that I was heading into the medical field for um, my future. And my brother was working in sales and both of us started to just question, you know, where this relationship with alcohol fell into our life. We always were very, you know, health aware, let's say. And so we did a lot of sports growing up, paying attention to like what we were eating. Our dad was, you know, reading all the books on health and wellness and would always kind of share those insights with us. And so it was just kind of this peak in this curiosity of why is alcohol so normalized in society and in these settings? And as we started to kind of look for options to make that transition to a less alcohol-centric lifestyle, we realized that there really wasn't anything that kind of served that need for us. And so, again, you started this off by saying that now there is a plethora of non-alcoholic options to choose from. But five years ago, six years ago, like there was very few and the category was so stagnant, so underloved. I mean, you think of non-alcoholic beer, it's really been around for a long time, right? Even into the prohibition times. And it's just been an afterthought for so many years. And so as we wanted to make this transition, what I noticed is the hardest factor was not having an option that I felt like was equally as exciting to reach for that didn't feel like a less than option. Um, and so we kind of dove head first. We wanted to create something that didn't exist at this time, something that, you know, brought life and energy and excitement into the category and obviously something that tasted good and delicious that you wanted to reach for. Um, and so, yeah, we we just jumped head first. Like I said, we were in Toronto at that time um, and we ultimately decided to pack up our lives and move across um, all the way to Denver to really launch Groovy. Yeah, incredible. I remember being in a Hollywood, California bar for my friend Darren's birthday in about 
2016 or 17, and I remember ordering an O'Doul's alcohol-free <laughs> beer. And, and I remember Darren and his partner at the time, Mary, making fun of me for drinking an O'Doul's. And I was also making fun of me for drinking an O'Doul's because I didn't actually even know that alcohol-free beer existed. That's how ignorant I was. And I remember drinking it, this this alcohol-free beer, and a couple of the other people at the party are like, like heard Darren making fun of me and like, what are you drinking? I'm like, oh, that look. And then they would have a sip of it and they go, oh, that tastes foul. That tastes like crap, et cetera. And I remember just nobody ever really contemplated the idea of drinking 0% alcohol alcohol essentially yeah. right zero percent but now fast forward to today as we're recording this 2024 like you said there's a plethora of options on the market including groovy which now is globally recognized with gold medals in in a non in the non-alcohol space the fact that they actually have a competition where they hand out hand out medals is a huge transformation from even five years yeah. ago isn't it yeah. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that because, you know, again, starting a business within that and being one of the first within the category, you've really been able to see the perception of society of bars and restaurants really change around the category too, right? And when we started, it wasn't very positive per se. You got a lot of negative reactions. You got a lot of, well, what's the point of that? Why Why would I ever, like you said, why would I ever want to drink a beer if there's no alcohol in it? As in the only reason that we are drinking it is ultimately to get drunk, is ultimately to have the effects of alcohol, right? But because alcohol has been so ingrained into society, there's these underlying reasons. We, we drink, we associate that with socializing, with making connections, with feeling happy. And so it was like, you still want to have all of those moments, but you actually might not want the effects and the negative effects of alcohol that come with that, right? And so now you fast forward and if we knock on the door of a restaurant, they understand that they need to have options, that they have consumers. And ultimately, all of this has been dictated by us, you know, the, the consumers looking for options, wanting more variety within um, our social settings. And so we've seen this category. It's now become actually the third fastest growing category in all of beverage, which is wow. crazy to see over these past years. Um, so I think it's just continuing. And even Europe has actually been a little bit more at the forefront um, in in, I guess I would say in having non-alcoholic options more readily available, like Germany has been one of the countries where because the culture of drinking beer is so innate to it, also having non-alcoholic options and non-alcoholic beer is actually makes up almost 8% of their alcoholic beer sales right now. And in North America, it's still at like 0.5% or so right now of alcoholic beer sales, but we're really on that trajectory upwards. I thought I read something somewhere that suggested that in 2023, a crazy stat, I don't know if it was 9% of all Heineken beer sales were of Heineken zero. Yeah, honestly, I, I honestly would not doubt that. Like, we might have to fact check that one. But it, it's it's a huge I mean, they're spending the, a huge amount of their marketing dollars now in really getting Heineken Zero out there. And people always kind of ask us, well, how do you like position, you know, groovy in comparison to all these big guys that have all of this money and dollars to spend? And I think it's amazing. I think if you, you know, groovy as a small business doesn't yet have those marketing dollars to spend, but Heineken's putting millions in talking about their non-alcoholic options, most of the ads I see for Heineken now when I'm walking around actually talk about their zero zero versus their their alcoholic beer, right? Which is is crazy to see a huge beer company like that make that shift. Yeah, it's incredible. Why did you guys move from Toronto, Canada and set up in Denver, Colorado? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. It gets a little confusing too with our story because obviously we kind of have these two home bases for the company. But ultimately, again, when we, the Canadian market's a little bit different in the sense that you have a few big monopolized grocery chains and then your liquor board is going through, you know, it's a government liquor board. And so when we started knocking on doors trying to sell Groovy, people didn't yet see the opportunity, right? They're like, you know, 
we don't need to have non-alcoholic options. No one wants this. And it was really hard to make any headway in getting into those bigger grocery stores. So the U.S., you know, you have a ton more small, independent liquor stores, grocery stores that you can actually work with on a one-on-one basis. And so we wanted to say, let's get our product out there. Let's get people to try it. Let's get feedback on it. Um, And so we're like, let's find where we want to go and get a pilot started, get some data. That's data that we can use to come back even when we do come back and enter back into Canada. And so Denver for us was really married this ideal consumer, right? So if you don't know, Denver is like craft beer mecca of the U.S. and you have tons of breweries and really the social environment is sitting outside and enjoying a nice beer with friends. And you also have this healthful mindset, right? So outdoorsy, doing adventures, people caring about what they're putting into their bodies and their health and many other facets. And so we thought it, I, it matches this consumer who has an affinity for beer, that flavor, that profile, but is also health intentional. And so You know, we had actually never really been to Denver before. We just (laughs) went in and we kind of, you know, again, we're knocking on doors, getting the product out there. And um, it really ended up being a really great fit for us to kick the brand off. And, um, you know, it's our strongest market right now as well. Uh, In just a little bit, I'm going to share a code with you listeners, uh, which will give you 20% off your first order online. Of Groovy. And if you want to check out the website, it's getgroovy.com, G E T G R U V I.com, getgroovy.com. How did you come up with Groovy as the name? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few reasons. I always say it's like threefold as to why the name Groovy came to be. And I think the first is just when you hear Groovy, you think of something, right? You think of a feeling, you think of having fun, letting loose. And our whole point is that you can do that. You don't need alcohol to do that. You can still get groovy. You can still have a great time. You can still be silly. Booze doesn't need to be a part of that equation. I think the other piece is when we think of, you know, the groovy term and we're thinking of the counterculture of, you know, the 70s is that's what we're doing now. It's the counterculture. It's challenging societal norms and how we drink and how we think about drinking. Um, And then obviously, as you've spoken about the spelling, we kind of gave it a new feel and look versus the classic double O groovy word. And part of that, again, is thinking of the category, bringing new, fresh life into something that you know, has been there for a long time, just like giving a new twist on how we spell groovy. Mm. I'm looking on the website here, Get Groovy, and it seems like you have alcohol-free rosé, alcohol-free dry secco, alcohol-free bubbly rosé. Let me have a look here. What else we got? Uh, 3,183 reviews. We've got groovy mocktail recipes. The branding says, stay healthy, stay social. The fun doesn't have to stop just because you're making better decisions. Oh, I like that. That's a good (laughs) little slogan. And then it looks like you've got a beer here. So what do you offer? I mean, I just read out a few of them. You've got, let's have a look here. You've got a craft non-alcoholic beer, uh, a juicy IPA, a golden lager, a pale ale, uh, that's the beers, but yeah, do you want to just walk us yeah, through? Yeah, I can, I can dive in. I mean, so as you said there, variety is kind of our thing. We have multiple options. And so when we started the company, we really started to do our research. What are the biggest barriers to entry again, to make that transition to less and no alcohol and into trying non-alcoholic options. And it came down to kind of three core pieces. So first is taste. And as you mentioned, we have, you know, proud to say that we have won gold medals in both non-alcoholic beer and wine, um, which has never been done by, before by a company. And we've made a lot of progression from where we started five years ago, and we're always iterating on our product. So taste first and foremost, to have it taste like the beer and wine that you know and love without the booze. The second is the variety, because Again, no other brand has decided to tackle on both non-alcoholic wines and beers, and we've even dabbled into sangrias now as they're ready to drink. And part of the reason behind that is, again, so any occasion, any moment that you want to reach for something, you have it, whether it's 
you know, brunch with the ladies and you want to have a mimosa or if it's cracking open a cold beer to watch the game or having, you know, a red wine with your steak dinner, whatever that looks like. We wanted it to feel like, again, you have a amazing choice to choose from whatever occasion it is. Um, and then the last piece is the accessibility that we've talked about, right? And so it needs to be as easy as possible for people to make that decision. Ultimately, when we started, it was an online business. Also, COVID had impacts into that. But now we've really shifted. Can we be in as many retailers as possible? So when you go into the store, you can grab your non-alcoholic options. Can we be in the bars and the restaurants? And right now we're really tapping into even the venues, right? So if you go to, you know, Ball Arena in Denver, you can now get groovy there if you're going to watch a basketball game, right? And so all of these occasions to make it, again, as easy as possible so that people feel empowered to make the choice that's best for them. And whether that's you've already decided that you're not drinking or you're just not drinking tonight for whatever reason, the choice is there. You at least have the choice. I'm curious, Coors Field in Denver, Colorado, where the baseball team plays out of Coors Field, Coors is the beer brand, right? Do yeah. you do they let Groovy sell their products at Coors Field or is that like a hard no? So we're we're actually working on that right now. So hopefully you'll be able to get our products in there soon. Um, but yeah, so what's interesting is most of the time, these are all sponsored by big alcoholic beer brands, a lot of the venues, right? And they've never really had non-alcoholic. I mean, for the most part, they haven't really had non-alcoholic options, right? They've had their, their waters and their sodas, but they haven't had an adult non-alcoholic option. So we're really starting to almost cut that out. And again, because Groovy's variety, it's we can cover their whole suite. We can have your beers, your wines, and your sangria, and your whole non-alcoholic menu at some of these venues and locations. So that's really a big focus for us moving into this summer, actually. Does that f- feel like that you're taking on the Goliath of the liquor industry in the sense that I would imagine that whores, for example, or any of these big companies would not want to welcome you with open open arms and say, yeah, come in here and possibly take revenue away from what we're doing. So have you bumped up against that? Like, has there been any of the big brands that have proactively or intentionally tried to not get you into either stadiums or have somehow tried to sabotage your your efforts? I think more than anything, it's been a bit of their ignorance on the importance of the category, right? They could really own some of those because now they have their own line extensions, but they haven't put their thought and effort into some of them. And so now the venues themselves are actually who's making this call, who's like, we want to have more inclusive options. And so we're going to work with partners that are ready to, you know, really invest into that part and to talk about non-alcoholic. And I think when it talks, when we like compare the big guys into, you know, some of these smaller brands and groovy as kind of a bit more of a craft player coming into the space, I think ultimately it comes down to the consumer as well. And I think authenticity is a big factor in how we choose what we consume across all categories right now. And I think a ton of the big brands or even just a lot of the breweries, they're going to come up with this line extension because they see the opportunities. They see the business opportunity in having a non-alcoholic option as a line extension. And at Groovy, it's our bread and butter. It's all that we do. It's the reason why we started, right? Like you said, there's a personal tie into it. And so I think the more that we can actually share that story out, that that resonates because that's where people are coming from and they want a brand that is really focused on that goal and that mission. So I wouldn't say that we've had anyone, you know, necessarily knocking on our doors or trying to bat us away, but I think that the more that we can kind of get our voices out there, that that's going to have a strong impact on on the category and our brand as a whole. Do you feel like you're competing against the liquor industry? Or do you feel when a Heineken comes out with a Heineken Zero, that actually helps Groovy? Do you feel like with increased awareness, and even if Coors came out with the 0% uh, options and Budweiser have a Bud Zero, of course, and, you know, as these big traditional liquor companies start 
producing their own 0% options. Are you in competition with them? That's how you feel? Or is that, do you think that's good for the category and it's good for Groovy? I think, I think it's twofold. I think there is a portion where you're on competition with some of the big alcohol brands. And I think that is a larger portion of how we glamorize alcohol as society, right? How when we think about even as our nutritional panels, as I go through packaging, what we need to put on there. And if you look at liquor and alcoholic beer, they don't need to put the calorie amount. They don't need to disclose what's in the product. And even as we talk about some of these things, like, you know, it's come up in Canada. Do we put cancer warning labels on alcohol, right? Because ultimately there is now a ton of research around that. And so you have a a huge Goliath of an industry that's going to tear a lot of that down. That's going to cover up a lot of that data that doesn't want to talk about it. But when I talk about, you know, the big brands coming out with a non-alcoholic option and investing their dollars into marketing, I think that, yes, ultimately that is growing the awareness as a whole. You're hitting demographics that wouldn't have thought about drinking less, that wouldn't have transitioned to you know, a Heineken zero zero and you're getting in front of them. And so I think the category is still at a standpoint where, you know, what's that saying? All rising tides, all the rising tides lift all boats. Right. And so I think that that's really how I approach the category now, instead of having this negative competition view, it's how can we build it together um, and really bring it to consumers in this positive standpoint. Mm. Yes. Have you noticed big liquor or big alcohol? That's what I like to call them now. Big alcohol. It's like big pharma, you know, like it's a way of suggesting the pharmaceutical companies don't have our best interests at heart, that they just want to make (laughs) a bunch of money. The big alcohol. Have you seen any dodgy behavior, for lack of a better word? Have you seen them try to suppress health warnings around alcohol the context of the question is uh, i had a um, wonderful guest on the show a couple months ago and i invite you the listener to go back and listen to it if you haven't already with professor tim stockwell and professor tim stockwell is out of the university of victoria in canada and he conducted uh, a study a study on 107 previously published studies on alcohol and its effects uh which involved Uh, more than 5 million participants. And his study results came out, which suggested that any any suggestion in any study that alcohol was good for you in any way was skewed and biased. And yet we see all of these studies that say a glass of wine is good for the heart health and all of this is growing, blah, 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 blah. And more than that, Professor Professor Stockwell shared with me on that particular episode, actually, I think I I released or published three episodes uh, with Professor Stockwell. He said that he actually experienced people trying to shut down his research. In fact, he was threatened by a liquor store chain owner because the liquor store chain owner found out that he was doing this study and that the results were going to paint alcohol in a poor light. And this liquor store opener felt like that was going to compromise his ability to generate income, obviously. And then more than that, Professor Stockwell shared that he actually had uh, organizations, you know, like uh, the body, like bodies of liquor companies, again, trying to influence study outcomes suppress anything that would damage alcohol's reputation that was that was what he shared so my question to you is have you experienced anything of that have you seen any of that have you heard anything like that yeah um i don't feel like i have a concrete example and experience per se with that i do find that again you know so canada was it last year 2020 Yes, that they came out with their new regulations on alcohol consumption, right? And so it hadn't been updated in like 11 years, 15 years, something along those lines. And so it was still saying that about 11, 15 drinks a week, it was kind of the guidelines. And now they've updated it to saying, you know, one to two a week. And we can't say any amount is is safe for you, right? And so there was this huge shock. And again, with that was kind of tied this notion, 
while it also, you know, many studies showing the impact of cancer, especially also women and breast cancer tied with the consumption of alcohol, do we put these label warnings on alcohol so that people have this awareness? And again, it's going back to like cigarettes, right? And it was mandated that they had to have that education on there. And so I think, you know, I haven't seen what's happening, but I know at the forefront ultimately is these big alcohol companies shutting that down as fast as they can, right? And there's still so many years that were put into these studies of a glass of wine a day is good for you, right? Mm -hmm. And that people still believe and believe. And I was really turned off when I watched, I don't know if you watched a Netflix episode or show like Blue Zones that was talking about these different areas where people live the longest. And I think it was in Greece that he pointed out like wine and brought that up as one of the five reasons why people are living the longest. And it was like, so many people are going to watch this and take the wrong, you know, story from that because they're going to go, okay, well, I can have my glass of wine and it's actually doing good for me. I'm going to live the longest actually, if I have a glass of wine a day. And I saw that up front at the farmer's market the following week, this lady being like, yeah, I watched that episode and the lady said it was good to have wine. And now she's buying herself wine. And so I think it's these subtle messages that have been infiltrated so deeply into our belief system that they're really hard to break down. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually sit on the board of AMBA. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is the Adult Non-Alcoholic Beverage Association. And so we formed this together and one of the founding members, we put this together two years ago, we're on our third year now, um, and brought together some of the independent non-alcoholic brands, beer, wine, liquor, um, to really start to build some of those guidelines and regulations around the category. Some of them are so outdated with, you know, the TTB, again, regulating non-alcoholic beer. You can't use words like lager to describe your product, but ultimately that is what our product is. It's been so long associated that a lager is going to have alcohol and we're all here to prove you wrong. It doesn't. Um, and so with AMBA, really starting to do a lot more work on the regulatory side, on how we think of the category, how the category gets placed in retail um, and ultimately providing that education to the consumer as well. Mm. I promised the listener a few minutes ago that I would share a 20% off your first order code for Groovy. So that code is AFL, which stands for Alcohol-Free Lifestyle. So if you are listening and you would like to try the Groovy products, then I invite you to go to getgroovy.com. And I'm assuming, Annika, there's a discount code or a coupon code or something there where they can enter AFL and that will yep. trigger 20% off your first online order. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. You can just enter it at checkout. And where do you deliver to and where do you not deliver to? Yeah, so on our website, we ship um, anywhere in the US, essentially. So if you're listening in Canada or Australia or Timbuktu, you're out of luck. Is that right? <laughs> in Canada, um, we we don't ship online, but we're available, readily available in many retailers, including Loblaws and Sobeys. Um, so you'll be able to find us. So also, if you are want to be able to support online retail, again, if that's the easiest way, you can also just go to the Finder on the website and see if there's a local store. Mm. What's What well-known chains of supermarkets are you in and across the united states um whole foods is a big one so we're in the majority of whole foods it's somewhat on a state per state basis so the finder is the best way to reference that um total wine and more across the country as well and then yeah we're in so you often go through liquor distributors so on a state per state basis a lot of the independents um some additional targets in some of the locations so i would reference that but whole foods and total one or more are pretty staples for us mm. you referenced earlier how society still believes that a glass of red wine is good for your heart and how preposterous that is based on what we know now do you know how all this myth began? I do, and I'm happy to share the story, but do you know where the myth actually originated from? I feel like I, I knew this at one point, but I think I might need a refresher. Yeah, so the myth is that a glass of wine is good for your heart, and people have been latching onto this since about 1991. And in 1991, 
what happened was is that the American TV news show 60 Minutes, they did a piece where they interviewed a French scientist by the name of Serge Renault, who became a hero of the wine industry because of this interview. And the 60 Minutes journalist, Morley Safer, a very, very famous 60 Minutes journalist, he's passed now, but very famous at the time, he latched on to this claim from the French scientist and he smiled as he raised a glass of red wine to the 33 million viewers who tuned in to that 60 Minutes episode that night. Well, so essentially, they interviewed this French scientist. They went over to France and the French scientist, who, who ironically or incidentally came from a, a, a vineyard family, came from a wine producing family, was saying, oh, you know, I'm confident that wine is good for the heart. It's good for your heart health. You know, the science is there, which, of course, it wasn't. But in 91, he was just saying this and 60 minutes la- lapped it up. They loved it. And the day following that 60 minutes episode, U.S. airlines reportedly ran out of red wine and red wine sales began to skyrocket. And for the next month, there was reports that red wine sales in the U.S. spiked by 44%. That's two and a half million additional bottles of red wine that were sold in the month after that 60 Minutes story. Now, to be clear, in 1991, the internet wasn't really a, a, a big thing. Right. Like, in fact, I don't even think it was a thing in 91 or if it was, it was just this cute little idea. So people tuned in to television at that stage. And and 60 Minutes was like a god of television news shows. 33 million people is a lot of people. And they re-aired the same episode a year later in 1992. And the same thing happened. The sales spiked again, but this time by 49 percent. And sales of red wine for the entire year from when the episode first aired to when they re-aired it a year later were up by 39%. And Americans never looked back. They devoured red wine as if it was protecting them from death and somehow improving their health. Now, there was just one big problem, though. The claims that alcohol was good for health have now been shown to be completely and utterly false, like completely and utterly false. That's how it started. And I get it. People love the idea. I mean, who wouldn't love the idea? Oh, I can have guilt-free wine. I can drink booze guilt-free and it's good for me. No problems. Let me have it. Yeah. But it's it's just plain not true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's crazy too, right? Because I think maybe it was that scientist that was talking about that, but the latched on to the polyphenol of resveratrol, which provides antioxidants into the wine, right? And so not once did they actually take a look at alcohol, right? And what that impact is having on it. And so it's funny because when I talk about non-alcoholic red wine, you're actually still getting the antioxidants now from that resveratrol without the effects of alcohol. Um, So in its innateness, yes, the antioxidants are good for you, but it's so easy to see, you know, I mean, you saw this too with, with some of, you know, in dairy and with fat and how sugar, right? Like all of those big industries tailored some sort of messaging for you to believe that it was actually having a positive impact on you. And when the real data comes through, it's, it's hard for people to start to rewire their brain of how they've been thinking maybe for years that this was good for you. And I even had an occasion with my uncle who, yeah, his whole life, he was told that, you know, 15 beers a week is that's fine for the male, the average male. Right. So that's, you know, maybe two a day. And all of a sudden he got this data that like, no, the government's saying that's not good. And it was a shock to him. He was like, he didn't think it was that bad because the government said, hey, you know, yeah, we can say two drinks a day is fine. And so he at that moment decided to, okay, I'm not drinking anymore. Um, And I think there was a lot of Canadians that were just so shocked by this news. And to me, it was shocking that there was no insight into it, right? That no one actually had the awareness about it. So I think sometimes, you know, maybe James, you and I are in our own bubbles where we talk a lot about the non-alcoholic industry and a lot of people that we are with don't really drink so much anymore. And as at a big scale, there's still a lot of education that needs to happen around this, right? There's so much education. I mean, but I would also submit that the reason why Groovy is so 
popular and so successful and why there are such a plethora of alcohol-free alternatives on the market now is because of increased education. I mean, now that we have the internet, there's plenty of health educators who are all over Instagram and TikTok. I mean, some of them I would submit are, are not great. <laughs> and But the majority, like now we have access to education. We've got chat GBT, we've got the internet, we can Google these things as long as we're we're getting our information from thorough resources and proven resources, then that's great. So I, I mean, certainly all the evidence seems to suggest that younger people, because of what I submit is increased education around the dangers of alcohol, are actually turning their back on alcohol, like they've never drunk less. Is that what you, you're experiencing and seeing? Yeah. I mean, I think Gen Z is leading a lot in, yeah, being the first generation to drink less than any other generation or not drink at all right off the bat, right? It's, I think there used to be this open the floodgates and it's like, I'm allowed to drink now and go all in. And, and they've already had kind of this awareness about the impact of alcohol before jumping and maybe seen the impacts of alcohol within, you know, their families. And I think also this awareness around, yeah, what are you consuming? What are you putting in your body? Your mental health, I think, is a big piece. Um, you know, my background in studying neuroscience and understanding somewhat that impact on alcohol and how that can really create a deeper loop for depression and anxiety. And so understanding how we can break that a little bit. But I think ultimately people still want to have this, the occasions. They still want to have those celebratory moments they still want to, you know, indulge in all that life has to offer. It's just alcohol is not really invited to that party anymore. Mm. And for I me, like I, I was really grateful because I, yes, at 22 started Groovy. And that's when I kind of had this awareness about the impact of alcohol. And, you know, most of Groovy's customers are actually on a bit of an older demographic, maybe 45, 50 and up. But for me, it was this life hack to, realized this at such a young age that I was like, I, I want to get it out there more. I want my friends to, you know, know that there are options. And again, just start to question that, bring that curiosity to this relationship. I think my whole time at school, it was mindless. Not once did I think if you were going out and there was going to be beer, like you were going to drink it. Like you weren't asking, Hey, do I actually want to drink beer tonight? Do I want to have, like, it was just unintentional. And so I think bringing that word mindful, um, and mindful drinking also is now coined as a term, how we can start to talk about that a little bit more. And I think, again, there's breaking down those barriers of judgment and shame and having to always have a reason as to why you're not drinking. Hey, it just doesn't make me feel that good. I don't want to drink tonight. Right. Um, and so we like to kind of use this saying that like true enjoyment comes from real empowerment, um, at Groovy. And so it's getting people to feel empowered to make that choice for themselves. What's the demographic of a Groovy customer? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. We kind of like to use these terms that we've coined the mindful embracers and the conscious strivers, but we're less focused on, let's say a demographic of gender and age. I mean, I can give you that in the sense that, you know, like I said, honestly, 45 and up is kind of our key consumer that is, you know, our heaviest fans for Groovy. Um, but overall, and then we have people coming from all different stories. So, you know, 70% that still drink alcohol to some various degrees, but are bringing in non-alcoholic options into their lifestyle. And the other that have made this transition to fully living an alcohol-free lifestyle. But I think at the end of the day, we kind of focus a little bit more on the mindset. And so this mindset of wanting to show up as your best self, wanting to, you know, be present in all that life has to offer, um, not kind of putting up with the bullshit and, you know, the negative impact alcohol has had. And so I think a lot is driven around that mindset versus a specific demographic. Do you feel like people who consume Groovy are still drinking alcohol you know, in addition to Groovy, or have they completely replaced their alcohol drinking with alcohol-free alternatives like Groovy? Yeah. So for us, and I can't give full data only based off of our online business, since I can't know who's always buying it off the shelf. Um, we're looking at something around, you know, 70% that still drink alcohol and the other 30% don't drink any alcohol. Um, the category as a whole, I think 
recently Nielsen had released this, which is sharing that 92% of consumers picking up non-alcoholic off the shelf also will have alcoholic options within their cart. Um, so I think that shows you again, this transition and people finding a bit maybe what that balance looks like for them, building a healthier relationship with alcohol. For me, my journey was really interesting in that having an option allowed me to slowly remove alcohol from my lifestyle and ultimately get to a point where I don't drink anymore. When I started Groovy, I still drank. And it was, again, it was about having an option when I didn't want to drink. But by having that option, I've now been like, okay, this feels feels exactly what I want. Feels like I want to have dinner and have my glass of wine, but I don't want the alcohol. And so there's various degrees on that. And I think a lot of people start maybe with that mixing it in. And ultimately, the more that they do that, they're like, okay, uh, this feels good. I like this and noticing all of these benefits that come with it. And it feels that that kind of hole that they were looking for. Maybe again, it was watching the game or whatever occasion it might have been for them that really had a strong hold to drinking alcohol. They've been able to replace that with a non-alcoholic option. Mm. Do you feel like someone who drinks far too much, they've got an alcohol misuse disorder, let's say. They're not an alcoholic, but they just drink far too much. Could be half a bottle of vodka each night. Could be a bottle of wine, bottle of bottle and a half, a six pack of beer, and it's really compromising their life. Question I get a lot is, should that person switch to alcohol-free alternatives, like an alcohol-free beer or an alcohol-free wine? Or is there too much association with beer and wine to just switch to an alcohol-free alternative? And so they would be better served by just stopping drinking, not choosing alcohol-free alternatives like Groovy and continuing on life that way. Do you have any views or thoughts on that? Yeah, I can't say that it's so black and white and that it's one way or the other. I think I like to think about it is non-alcoholic options as a whole and groovy can be a great tool in the toolbox, right? And whether that's the tool for you that's going to help you actually make that transition. Yes. For others, totally. It's It could be something that's like, you know, the Flavor of beer is too familiar to me. It's a trigger to me, and therefore I don't want to have it, right? And so I really encourage people to not follow a guideline here or there, but understand what is going to work for them. And I think, James, you and I talked about this, but maybe it's when you start to make that transition at the beginning, getting a little bit more to that comfort level, and then reintroducing non-alcoholic options. Um, but I've also had so many stories of people that come to us and say, you know, groovy saved my life. It allowed me to make that transition. I wouldn't have been able to make it without having, you know, your Prosecco in an occasion. So I really think it's about thinking of that kind of toolbox point of view and finding the tools that work for you. Yeah, you have an engaged community, as I understand it. You've got uh, an email list and you send them updated versions of newsletters. What are some of the success stories that your customers have shared with you regarding the impact that either switching to Groovy or introducing Groovy into their life uh, has had on their lives? Yeah, uh, we have a little Slack channel at the Groovy team too. Whenever we get these, you know, emails or DMs or messages, that we share them with the whole team because I think at the end of the day, that's what drives us forward. That's what keeps me motivated, even on the hard days. Um, and so I think you know, there's a few standout stories. One of which, I think there's a lot of stories actually in which. Some of their family had strong struggles with alcohol, right? Maybe their father or um, kind of a close loved one. And so they never really felt like, okay, I have a bit of that tolerance and I don't want to go down that path. And having a non-alcoholic option, having Groovy's IPA allowed them to still like, you know, fully feel included in all of the occasions and moments that they were able to enjoy without alcohol and kind of cut that off before it even went down, you know, a bit of a, maybe what could be a darker path. Um, and then I think, yeah, a lot of people were this maybe gray area drinking, you're drinking a lot, you're maybe don't identify as an alcoholic. Um, but Hey, a glass of wine turns into a bottle of a wine 
a night and it's like, uh oh, this is getting out of control. This is not where I want to go. And by subbing in, you know, groovy, this little aha moment of, okay, I can still have my bubble bath and my glass of wine and I can actually eliminate that feeling. And I think it just starts to snowball, right? As you start to actually separate yourself from alcohol and start to notice how your body responds to that, how you wake up feeling refreshed. I think once you know what it feels like to feel a hundred percent, it's so hard to go back. Like you just, you can't do it. Right. And that's why it's like, I don't identify as completely sober, but every time I ask myself, "Ah, I need to, I need to be a hundred percent tomorrow. I don't want to be 90 5% even if I just have one glass. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had multiple zoom calls with, you know, our biggest fans and having them turn into tears on the call of just how grateful they, they are of, of having an option like this and of being able to show up as their best self now. And I think a lot of it too, is it's cool to see people driven by, even their their young ones. I'm not a mom yet, so I don't think I can speak to that, but of understanding the role model that you want to create for someone, right? And to be present in in those moments, especially when you have a little one, to be there, to not be like, oh, I need wine to be able to be a mom. And I think there's this whole mommy wine culture that has, again, a stronghold of big alcohol saying that this is what's needed, right? If you're an AFL listener and you'd like to try out Groovy, go to getgroovy.com and you can just enter the code AFL to trigger 20% off your first order. And uh, there is a Groovy finder on the website where you can click in your zip code and it will show you where you could actually pick up Groovy in person. Um, So check out that website, getgroovy.com. Annika, final question. Where do you see this space going like what's your prediction or hypothesis for both the alcohol free alternative industry over the next let's say uh one to five years and where do you feel groovy is going in that same time one to five years yeah great question i think you know our vision ultimately is to create a world where it's not only normalized, but celebrated to have non-alcoholic options and for those living in alcohol-free lifestyle. And emphasis on that word celebrated, because I think getting to a normalized point is one goal, but actually having it feel like, okay, you know, this is exciting. And when I see the whole category, it's still very in its nascent, you know, phase, I would say. And this year, next year, I really start to see that maturation of the category. So like I said, starting to think about things around the guidelines, the regulations, the safety of the category, because non-alcoholic is not very easy to produce. And a lot of people don't know that, but it's complicated. When you remove alcohol, which, you know, ultimately is going to kill bacteria, it becomes somewhat of a volatile product. So you need to make sure you're pasteurizing it and going through a lot of regulatory protocol. Um, So I see that in the coming year from like the category standpoint. And then, like I said, on premise, like all of these occasions, so really expanding the occasions and expanding what socialization. Now we see non-alcoholic bars popping up. Right. And so creating more of these occasions that don't revolve around alcohol in we still want to socialize at the end of the day, that's we're social creatures. And that is actually the thing that's going to help us live the longest. So I think that we're really going to see a bigger shift in how we can still have those settings without alcohol being kind of an integral part to it. Anna Kasani, co-founder of Ruby. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your guidance and telling us your story on the call today. Really appreciate your time and keep uh, doing what you're doing. Uh, we love your products. We're a big supporter of you and the brand and uh, keep living an alcohol-free lifestyle. Great. Thank you so much. I had a great time.